And so tonight I wanna to talk to you about if God called you today to do something, would you be ready? All right, that's what I wanna focus on tonight. If God called you today to do something, would you be ready right now? Or would you have to make reservation to be able to do what God has called you to do? Some things you still gotta put in order, all right? So we're gonna look at some things that happen in the word uh, of those who actually were ready when God called them at the moment. So the question becomes, if God called you to do something today, are you ready right now? So if he told you to do something right now, tonight, today, would you be able to do it? Or would you have to make reservation or make excuses why you can't do it, okay? So the first thing I wanna start out with, let's go to the book of uh, Matthews. Because first of all, God is looking for workers. God is looking for laborers, okay? So we wanna start out in Matthew's gospel, chapter number nine. Let's start out in verse number 36. This is the King James version of the Bible, Matthew's gospel, chapter number nine, starting at verse number 36. It says, but when he saw the multitude, talking about Jesus, when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth laborers into his harvest. All right, I wanna read that also from, let's take a look at the um, NLT, New Living Translation. Same verse, starting at verse number six, Matthew's Gospel 9, verse number 36 from the NLT, New Living Translation says this, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogue and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers, so here he used the word workers, King James says the laborers, all right? So the same word, all right? He says here, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. All right, so Jesus, as he was ministering and went into the different towns, as we read, you know, he had compassion on the people because many of them, um, the New Living Translation says, many of them were confused and helpless, you know, and I believe it was referring more to like spiritual things. When it came to spiritual things, you know, a lot of folks were confused back in Jesus' days because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the one who was controlling the hermeneutics. In other words, they were controlling the interpretation of the scriptures and they were not doing a very good job. Because even when Jesus came on the scene, he said, listen, except our righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribe and Pharisees, we will not in, in no way enter into the kingdom of God. So we have to go beyond what the Pharisees and the scribe were doing. So they were not really teaching the people right. And so Jesus had compassion on the multitude because he's seen a lot of people confused and helpless. And you know what? Even with a lot of the teaching that's going on in the world today, there's still a lot of people who are confused when it comes to, you know, developing a relationship with God. You know, we're searching and sometimes we're searching in the wrong places and we're going to all these different churches and a lot of times you become more confused than you would getting an understanding of what you're looking for because you're going to all these different places and everybody's teaching something different. You know, you wind up more confused. And so the best way to get to some place where you can actually learn what you need to learn spiritually, you need to pray and ask God to lead you where to go. You just can't go everywhere because you can wind up more confused than when you start out. So Jesus saw and he had compassion on the people because many of them were confused and they were helpless. And then we, we keep on reading. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. All right. And so, again, sheep needs a shepherd. They need a teaching shepherd. They need somebody that can teach them and lead them. Because, again, a sheep can't lead itself. A sheep always need a shepherd to lead them, to watch, for, to watch for them, to watch over them. And so that's why David even quoted in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, because we're all sheep. We're all his sheep. 
And the Lord God, Jesus, is our shepherd. He's the one that watch over us. God, you know, we can't keep ourselves. We can't watch over ourselves. So we all need a shepherd. Even if you are an adult, you still need a shepherd. You need someone to watch over us. And so we're able to say, like David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one that watch over me. He's the one that keeps me. So Jesus saw that the people needed a shepherd. Are you blessed tonight to have a shepherd that watch over your soul? Are you blessed tonight with a shepherd that teaches you the word of God so that you can get closer to him, that you can grow in him, that you can understand your purpose in life? That's a blessing. You know, so I say to all of you that are listening, you know, if you're sitting under a shepherd that's feeding you the word of God so that you can get closer to God, so that you can grow in your walk with God, so you can understand your purpose for existence, then you ought to give God praise for your shepherd and you ought to pray for that. All right, because I want you to know something. Every shepherd have a target on their head as far as the enemy is concerned, because the enemy is always looking to take out the shepherd, because if he can take out the shepherd, then the sheep will be scattered. So again, if you have a shepherd that's feeding you and helping you to grow and see God in a better way, then keep your leaders and your shepherd lifted up in prayer. So Jesus saw that the people needed a shepherd and he turned and he said to the disciples, and again, this is the NLT version. He said, the harvest is great. There's a lot of people that need salvation. There's a lot of people that need to know about God. But the workers, the workers, and remember we said the laborers in King James, it says the workers are few. So again, we're pointing out that God is looking for workers. So he tells us what to do to get some workers in. He says, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. So what this is saying to me, everybody that's in the house of the Lord, everybody that's a part of God's kingdom, supposed to be working. Because it says here, the, 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 the harvest is plenteous. Or oh, there's a lot of folks that need Christ, but the workers those who are willing to share the gospel, those who are available to be used by God are few. So again, we're talking about tonight, if God were to call you today to do something, would you be ready right now? So Jesus looked around, you know, saw that the people were helpless, all right, confused. He needed some workers that he could call on that would be available to work right now. So he tells us what we should do. We should pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send more workers. So one of the things I mentioned before, everybody that's a part of God's kingdom supposed to be working. Everybody that's a part of a church, once you have become a part of that church and you join the membership and you go through the disciple classes and the things that are the requirement for that particular church, at some point you need to engage. At some point you need to be involved in the ministry because again, Jesus said we're supposed to be praying for workers. So everybody in the church is supposed to be working. Everybody in the church is supposed to be doing something. And so if you've been in church for quite a while and you're not doing anything, you need to ask yourself a question. Why are you sitting around doing nothing? Because everybody is supposed to be working. Listen to me. You can't keep gleaning and can't keep eating spiritually and then you don't give anything back. It doesn't work that way. All right. So again, God is looking for laborers. He's looking for workers. And we ought to pray that God would send some more workers in the church, all right? We could always use helpers and workers. And we need good helpers. And we need good workers, those that have the heart of God, amen, that love God and love the things of God and love the people of God, you know, because those are the folks that's going to do everything. They're going to do it right, and they're going to do it with all their heart, okay? So, again, everybody should be working in the house of the Lord. God is looking for laborers, and we ought to pray for workers. All right, let's keep moving forward in the word. I want to look at some people in the Bible quickly, um, of people who are in the, in, in the scriptures who, are, who necessarily don't even have a title. Because some people think, well, in order for me to be doing something in the house of God, I need to have a title or something. You know, I need to either be like an usher or a deacon or an evangelist or, you know, a teacher, or, you know, an usher. No, 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 you don't need a title. You don't need a title. God uses laymen in the church, people without titles. And so that's what I'm going to start with. I'm going to show you some people in the Bible who did some awesome things and didn't have no titles. All right? Because titles don't make you anyway. You make the title. Because there are people who have titles that don't live up to the title. So the title don't make you. You make the title. You create the title. You live up to the title. And then people start calling, it, calling you that because that's what they see in you. Okay? So again, you don't need a title 
before God can use you and start doing things in the church. When you find that there's a need and something needs to be done, then you volunteer your services, okay? And again, you don't have to wait till somebody come up to you and ask you to do something. You see a need and God put some things in your heart, yes, volunteer, all right? Because I'm pretty sure whatever house you're in, in the house of God, there's somewhere they need some help. And the church said, amen. So now I'm gonna start with um, a, a person in the Bible who did not have a title, all right? And there's several of them in the Bible who had no titles, but God used them in a mighty way. Why? Because God needed somebody and they made themselves available. They were ready right then. No excuses. Okay. And at some point we're going to get to the people too in the Bible that when Jesus called them and said he need help, you know, they made excuses why they couldn't go. Okay. So we'll get to that too. All right. So let's start out in the book of Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter number nine. And just for you, those of you who are not familiar with this story, uh, in the book of Acts chapter number nine, it starts out uh, with a story about a man named Saul. Saul, all right? And later on, you're going to find out that Saul became Apostle Paul. His name was changed, you know, on his journey. Something happened, and he had a name change, all right? Because remember, when you come into a relationship with God, there's a name change. Just like when Abraham became, came into a relationship with God, his name was Abram. But when he came into a relationship with God, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. Okay, so there's always a name change because remember, name change has to do with covenant. When, when two people come together and get married, there's a name change. So when you come into covenant relationship with God, there is a name change. So we're gonna see later on that his name was changed from Saul to Paul after he got into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And we know that Paul did great things for the kingdom of God. Saul, on the other hand, was the one who went around persecuting the church, trying to destroy the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So for some of you that are not um, familiar with the scripture, I'll, I'll back up in the verse. But the key verse uh, that I want you to see in this, in, this, in this particular chapter, I'll go down to that verse first and then I'll come back. Okay, so let's look at verse number 10 because again, this is where I get the title from, from this message tonight. If God called you to do something today, will you be ready right now? So I wanna read verse 10 then I'm gonna go back and give you a little history on the chapter. So verse number 10 said, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. So that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about a certain disciple who didn't have a title. All the Bible says he was a disciple and his name was Ananias. All right, I think when I read it in a different translation, let me see how it reads in um, uh, the NLT. It says, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. So you see there, it still has no title, no title. So the New Living Translation says, there was a believer named Ananias all right, and then we just read there, I'm going back to King James. We read there in the King James version that there was a disciple with no title at Damascus named Ananias. To him, the Lord, to him, said the Lord in a vision. Ananias, the Lord called him by name, and he said, behold, I am here, Lord. Mm, 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 mm. Notice what God, what, what, how Ananias responded when God called him. God called him by name, and notice what his response was. Behold, I am here, Lord. In other words, Lord, look, I'm ready. What you need? God didn't tell him anything, just called him by his name, and his response was, Lord, I'm ready. So if God were to call you to do something, could you say, Lord, I'm ready right now? No reservations. Whatever you need me to do, I'm on my way. All you have to do is say is go and I'm gone. Come on. So now we see God speaks to Ananias and his response was, so I want you to underline, behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said, arise and go into the street, which is called straight and inquire in the house of uh, Judas for one named Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he prayed and he seeth in a vision, a man named Ananias, <laughs> wow, coming in. How, how you see in a vision a man named Ananias, unless the man say his name in the vision? <laughs> so God says, I, I showed him you in a vision. He didn't know that that's your name, but he saw a man in a vision, and that man he saw was you. So God already knew in advance how Ananias was going to respond to his call, because God already gave Saul the dream, all right, before he even asked Ananias to, to rise and go and meet with Saul. So God already knew what Ananias' response would be. Mm, 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 mm. See, God already knows. 
All right, he already knows how you're gonna respond. He don't determine your response, but he knows. He already know what you're gonna do. You determine your own response. God does not determine your response, but he know what your response is gonna be. So he already knew Ananias would say, behold, I'm here, Lord, I'm ready. All right, that's awesome. I love it, I love it. Okay, so again, let's keep going. Mm. He says, I'm here. Lord told me to go to Straight Street, inquire in the house of somebody named, uh, of Judah's house, and ask for Saul of Tarshish. For he see a man, it says, and he was praying, and see it in a vision, a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Okay. All right, so again, I backed up a little bit, but let's just go back, uh, or I skipped down to verse number 10, but let's go back to the beginning so we can give you a little history uh, for those of you who are not familiar with who Saul was before he came into covenant relationship with God. It had a name change and became Paul. All right, so let me give you a little history. Let's go back to verse number one. And it says, and Saul, and I'm back in the King James Version, and Saul yet breathing out threatening and, and slaughtering against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desire of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue. So again, uh, Saul was threatening the church, threatening the saints, killing the saints. Anybody who was calling on Jesus, or because remember the gospel was new at this time. You know, Jesus had just died. The disciples are now preaching the good news of the gospel. So this is a new teaching in the land. And so they used, and again, uh, Saul is used to the teaching of the, of the Pharisees. Because <laughs> he said, I think I want to take, he said, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So he was, he was used to that kind of teaching. And so what Jesus brought was a new type of teaching. So anybody who was teaching what Jesus was teaching, listen, he went to get a letter so he can incarcerate anybody who's trying to bring about this new doctrine. Okay, so let's keep going. Verse number three. And desire of him, letter of Damascus to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, the way of Christ, the way of cross, anybody walking, uh, anybody uh, living in this way, this new way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, who art thou Lord? This is how Saul responded. Who are you Lord? Didn't just say, who are you? He said, who are you Lord? Because remember, Saul thought he was all that. You know, incarcerating people have the authority to put people in jail. And you know, sometimes when you give people a certain authority, it goes to their head. You know, you give them a little badge and it goes to their head. So, so Saul had a, 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 a big head, so to speak, because he had a little authority to, to incarcerate people or, or at least heading to get a letter to do that. And he knew that the Pharisees would be all for this because they didn't agree with Jesus' teaching anyway. So when the Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul answered and said, who art thou, Lord? Call him Lord. Because you know why? Nobody never knocked him off his beast before because he thought he was all that. It says while he was on his way to Damascus, a light shined about him and he fell to the earth. So the Holy Spirit, the power of God, while he was on his way to Damascus to get this letter, the power of God knocked him off his beast. So nobody never done that before. So you must be a Lord. So that's how I believe, this is why I believe he answered that way. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the prick. In other words, you are fighting a losing battle. You know, somebody made a play. Your arms are too short to box with God. Listen, you don't have a chance against God. So he is letting Saul know, listen, man, it's hard for you to kick against the prick. You fighting a losing battle. So you might as well give it up. You might as well come on my side because you're going to lose, brother. It's hard for you to kick against the prick. Verse number six, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, call him Lord again, what will thou have me to do? Oh, that sounds like somebody that's ready. All right, now here's a man that really had no title with God, no titles with believers. As a matter of fact, he has a terrible reputation when it comes to believers because there were a lot of believers that were afraid of this guy. They heard about him in the past and we keep reading and we're gonna see what, how Ananias responded when the Lord told him, I need you to meet with Saul. Ananias knew about Saul's past. Mm. All right. Okay, watch this now. So he said, he's trembling. He's astonished. Call him Lord again. He says, what will thou have me to do? Again, this is a man that after he got knocked off his beast, uh, sound like he's ready. 
<laughs> Don't sound like no reservation here. All right. So again, he has no title. He's not known as the Apostle Paul yet. He's just Saul. All right. And to the family of God in, in Bible time, he's nobody but somebody who's persecuting the church. So he has, again, a terrible reputation among the church. But when the Lord knocked him off his beast and he fell to the ground, he called him Lord twice. And he says, listen, I have no reservation. What you want me to do, Lord? You know what, make, what it makes me think about? You don't want to wait till God have to knock you off your high horse. Whatever high horse you might be riding on, whoever you are, before you decide you're going to do the, the Lord's work, before you decide that you're going to do what God placed you here to do. That, you shouldn't even allow it to get to that point. Be ready now. Be ready now. <laughs> Glory to God. All right, let's keep going. So again, call him Lord twice. And then he responded, what will thou have me to do? The Lord said unto him, arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless because he wasn't by himself on his way to Damascus. He had his entourage with him. And when that light shone, shined from heaven and knocked him off his beast and the voice started talking to him, his entourage that was with him, they stood speechless. They're like, what in the world is going on here? We just saw our leader got knocked off his beast. He's down on the ground scuffling like he can't see. And as a matter of fact, as we continue to read, you're gonna see he went blind. So they were speechless and now they hear a voice. Somebody's talking and they don't see anybody. Like what is going on here? <laughs> wow, let's keep going. So again, the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. So he got knocked off his beast, and when he opened his eyes, he was blind. He got up from the earth, he says, he opened his eyes, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into the Damascus. So the Lord still let him go to Damascus, but he had to be led there now because he's blind. And brought him into the Damascus, and he was there three days without sight. <laughs> and, oh, glory. And neither did he eat nor drink. So God still let him go where he was going, but he couldn't accomplish what he went there to go, what he went there for. So God still let him go to Damascus, and he, he remained there three days and could not accomplish what he went there for. That was to get that letter. Mm. Let's keep going. So now we're, now, in, now we're at verse number 10. So you get a little background of the story there. Verse number 10. Now, if there was a certain disciple, we've talked about this before, there's another disciple who has no position in the kingdom. And we read earlier a certain believer when we read it from the New Living Translation. Remember that. So a certain disciple, a certain believer named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, behold, I am here, Lord. The Lord said unto him, arise and go into the street, which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he prayed, and he seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. That's powerful. Okay, so again, I pointed out, we jumped down to verse number 10 because I want you to see Ananias' response. Now, remember I told you Ananias knew about Saul's history. So let's keep reading. Verse number 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I heard by many of this man, how much evil have done he, he have done to thy saints at Jerusalem. So I heard about this guy. Are you sure you want me to go lay hand on this heathen, on this devil? Listen, the word's been going around what this brother's been doing or what this man's been doing. The word's been going around. He's done much evil to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he have the authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Verse number 15, but the Lord said, so again, I love it. Ananias refers to Saul history. But you know one thing I love about God? He never calls us based on our past. In other words, God don't consult your past to this, determine your, your future. Oh, make a note of that. God does not consult your past to determine your future. If it was up to Ananias, it would probably would have been contingent upon Saul's past, because he went back to Saul's past. Listen, we heard some evil and the things that he'd done to the saints. You sure you want me to lay hand on this guy so he can perpetuate some more evil? But God did not consult with Saul's past to determine the future that God had for Saul. I love it. 
And that's something that you can use in your own personal life. I don't care what kind of background you came from or what you did before knowing the Lord, prior to knowing the Lord. Okay, God does not use you based on what you've done in the past, because anybody who comes into Christ, the Bible says that you are a new creature and old things are passed away. That means that old past that you had is passed away and all things have become new. So when you come in Christ, you don't have a past. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks of us being babies in Christ and a baby do not have a past. All right. So, again, all of us. We had a past. But once we accept Jesus as our Lord and he puts us on straight street, and I love it. Notice where God sent Saul. We kind of skipped over that a little bit. But notice where God sent Saul. Tell him, listen, I need you to go to straight street. I mean, no, God can put your life on straight street if you're walking down a crooked path or you're living a, crook, a crooked life. Come on, God can put you on straight street. And I, I don't think it was by chance that he had to go to straight street to meet Ananias. Again, if you want to meet God, listen, you got to let folks lead you where you can go to the straight street and go to the place where you can get the word of God so that you can make a connection with God so that you can have a relationship with God. God will send somebody your way if you really want to know him, if you really want to meet him. God can put your life on straight street. All right, let's keep going. So again, Ananias said, you sure you want me to lay hand on this person? You know, we, we heard about his past. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. So listen, go do it. Because remember, Ananias is ready. I'm ready to do, Lord, but I just want to check. Make sure I'm hearing right about laying hands on this guy, on this devil. I just want to make sure I'm hearing right. The Lord said, listen, go ahead and do. Go as you said you were going to do. You're ready. He says, go thy way, for I have chosen him. He's a chosen vessel unto me. Oh, I love it to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So he has a, a, a three-part assignment here. And that assignment is to bear his name to the Gentiles, to the heathens, to those who are, uh, are not in covenant relationship with God, to kings, those that are in position of authority. And you got to be careful when confronting those in position of authority. How are you going to persuade those that are in position of authority because they have so much power you really got to be walking in the wisdom of God to persuade people that are in authority because they already have their ideology of how they think and how they're going to run the government. You know, when I thought about that, it kind of reminded me of King Agrippa. And I don't want to jump too far ahead, but when Saul became Paul, his message was so powerful that King Agrippa, you read this in the book of Acts, King Agrippa said, Paul, listen, your teaching was so good, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. So God is saying, listen, Ananias, go lay hand on him because this man's assignment is great. It's three part. The first part is to the heathens, those that are not or do not have a, a, a relationship or a covenant relationship with God. I'm going to send him to kings, people that are hard to convince because they're already set in their ways and their ideology on how they're going to run the government and how they're going to do things. So I'm going to send you to kings. And remember, King Agrippa said, man, you almost persuade me. Your message was so good. All right. So that's a little homework assignment. You can look that up. Look up uh, King Agrippa is in the book of Acts and you can read the story about King Agrippa. All right. So he says, a chosen vessel unto me that he may bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So that's a three part assignment for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Say, so listen, the brother is going to suffer. He's going to go through some things. I'm going to show him some things that he's going to have to suffer for my namesake. Some persecution that he's going to have to go through because he's upholding my name. Hmm. All right. You can dish it out to the saints. Let's see if you can take it. Because most of the time, people who dish out persecution can't take it themselves. You know, but they're quick to dish out persecution and, and ridicule people and, and make people feel bad and put people down. But when it's done to them, most of the time, they can't take it. So God says, okay, listen, do as you said, Ananias. He's a chosen vessel. And he's going to go to the Gentiles. He's going to go to the kings. And he's going to go to the children of Israel. All right? I'm going to show him what great things he will suffer for my name's sake. Mm, 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 mm. All right? So again, we're still talking about Ananias, who's a, a believer, a disciple, who has no title. Look who he lays hands on. Let's keep going. I don't want to jump ahead. Now you're going to see what he's getting ready, who he's getting ready to lay hands on because, again, we know who Saul became. 
Mm, 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 mm. God didn't use somebody that had an apostle title to lay hands on somebody who would become one of the greatest apostles known in the New Testament. He used a layman, a person with no title. Wow. Glory to God. You know what that means? That put, that, that put you in a position right now to be used by God. All of us. Glory to God. That puts us all in a, a position right now to be used by God. See, men get caught up in titles. God is not really into the title thing. That's us. You know, I'm Bishop so-and-so. I'm Apostle so-and-so. I'm Evangelist so Come on. Listen, I'm, I'm Brother G. You know, you call me Brother G if you want. You know, they call me Pastor G. They call me Bishop G. I don't make a big thing if somebody say Pastor or Bishop or Brother. Come on. We're all part of the family God. I, 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 I say it this way. I appreciate you respecting the title. But believe me, I'm not caught up in the bishopship. I'm a brother just like you. Come on. Even, even again, I'm jumping ahead. There were times when Saul, who became Paul, did great exploits and he healed folks and folks started bowing down to him. He said, hey, hey, no, don't do that. I'm a man just like you. Get up off your feet. Don't bow down to me. Give Jesus glory. Ah, glory to God. Hey, man, listen, I learned from the best. I never let no title go to my head because it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. He's the chief shepherd. And the Bible says he is the bishop of our souls. So he's the true bishop. You know, he's the shepherd. I'm just the under shepherd. Come on. All right. Let's keep going. Again, we're still talking about Ananias, a no title believer, a no title disciple. Verse number 17. Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hand on him said, brother, Wait a minute. This is the same man. That, and I said, God, you sure you want me to lay hand on this brother? On this, no, I didn't call him brother. You, you sure you want me to lay hands on this man? Because we heard the stuff that he done and how he persecuted the saint at Jerusalem. But when God gave him the okay to go ahead, notice what he called Saul. I love it. He went into the house. He put his hands on him and called him brother. So that means he was willing to forget the past, just like God was for, willing to forget Saul's past. How many know we as other believers as believers in the body of Christ, and God is willing to forget somebody's past, even if you know their past, you gotta be willing to forgive them of their past too. Apostle Paul said in one scripture, he says, I know no man according to the flesh. He says, if you're in Christ, I don't know you according to what you did when you were walking in the flesh. I know no man according to the flesh. I love that phrase, all right? So I don't judge you based on your past life and where you came from. I judge you now based on the life that you live or you profess through Jesus Christ. So if God is willing to forgive someone of their past, guess what you have to do? Selah, think on that. Glory to God. All right, so again, Saul comes in and put his hands around him and say, brother, Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest have sent me. Oh, I love it. And I said, I didn't come on my own. The Lord that knocked you off your beast. He spoke to me and he sent me to you. Ooh wee. Man, there's a, there's a message in that, but I don't want to jump ahead. Mm, mm. Lord, have mercy. Okay, let me keep going. I'm getting excited here. Let's keep going. Uh, it says mm, that thou mayest receive thy sight. So the Lord sent me to you so that you can receive sight. Remember, Saul is still blind. And be filled with the Holy Ghost. So he sent me here for two reasons. To open up your eyes, because you blind, brother. That's why we sing the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, That Save a Wretch Like Me. I once was lost, but now found I was blind. We all were blind. Before we knew Christ, we all were blind. We were living in sin, doing our own thing. We were blind to the fact and the purpose for which God has placed us here for. We were doing our own thing. We all were blind. But aren't you glad for grace that we can testify we once was blind, but now we see. God sent me here, Saul, for you so that you can, for two things so that you can receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Listen, something powerful happened through a layman. I want you to know something. Before Saul left that house, he received three things. His eyes was open to the truth. He was blind. So when the analyzed lay hand on him so he could see, so he could see, it wasn't just so he could see naturally, but that he could see the true Lord. Who is the true Lord? So God opened up his eyes because he was blind and God allowed him to see that he was walking in error. And let me tell you something, Saul had a zeal 
when he was walking in error to destroy the saint, that same zeal that he had to kill the saint was the same zeal he brought into the kingdom. I mean, he was on fire for God. So listen to me, the same tenacity and fire that you had when you were in the world pursuing your dreams and your career and what you want to do with your life and you were gun hold. Listen, you got to bring that same zeal into the house of God. Come on, you got to bring that same fire into the house of God. Amen. And work in the house of God with that same kind of zeal because the Saul had the same kind of zeal when he became a child of God. Oh, glory. Where's your zeal? Come on, family. Where's your zeal for the things of God? You can't show more zeal for worldly things than you do for the one who created you, than you do for the work for the one who created you. You can't show more zeal for the world. The world didn't put you here. The world didn't save you. The world don't provide for you. The world certainly don't look out for you. Because all the world does is use you up. And look at all the celebrities who don't lost their life because of the world. Give you a whole bunch of fame and fortune and use you up until there's nothing left of you. Mm, 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 mm. My Lord, my Lord, this is good tonight. This is good. So again, Saul left with three things. He got his sight, filled with the Holy Ghost. And the third thing he left, and you don't see it here, but I'm going to tell you what it is. And it, and it takes the Holy Spirit to discern this. Let me go back. He said, the Lord sent me here that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received this sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Mm. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. All right. So again, we see baptism. So let me add another thing. There's four things now that he left there with. All right. So he left there with his eyes being open. He left there being filled with the Holy Ghost. He left there being baptized in the water. Come on. To symbolize I'm a part of the family. I want to let, I want to let the folks know, those who saw me persecuting people, that I've been buried with Christ. I, I'm not the same person. So you have to do that water baptism because you do that to, oh, that's an open baptism to, the, to, 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 as a declaration to let people know that's watching. The person that you see now I'm, that's going in this water, the person you see now, this is the old person. I'm about to lay down in this water like a grave. The old person is dying. When I come, it's dead. So when I come about this water, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. So you invite everybody who walk with you, who knew you before you knew the Lord, you invite them to your baptism. Because that's what baptism, water baptism is an open declaration of what has occurred on the inside of you. So you want the world to know. Listen, that person you used to know, that's this person here standing in the water. But when I go down this water and I'm, and I'm laying in the water like a grave, when I come up out of this water, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. So we see here, so far he left with three things. The fourth thing he left with was ministry. Because remember I told you he had one of the greatest ministry. So he left Ananias' house, a no title brother, laid hand on a man who became one of the greatest apostles, who wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Most of the books in the New Testament was written by this man named Saul, who had hands laid on him by a believer or a disciple with no name. Come on. And God used Ananias to do this, and he used Saul in a great way. And his name later became Paul. All right, so then it says, you know, he arose, he went forth, he was baptized, verse number 19, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. And then you keep on reading, it talks about he spent a few days with the disciples at Damascus and so forth and so on. Okay, so again, we see a two no-name people, Saul, who was really nobody in the body of Christ, later become someone in Christ, become the great apostle that we know today. We see Ananias, who had no title, was used by God. Why? Because God says, Ananias, Ananias says in verse number 10, behold, I am here. So this is what we're talking about tonight. If God was to call you or ask you to do something right now, would you be able to say, I'm ready? Now, I mentioned before, there are people who, when God called them, they have excuses. So let's go to that. I have a few more minutes left. Let's go to Matthew chapter number eight. I hope you're not a part of those folks who got excuses that when God called you, you know, God, you know, I would come to church. And how many of you know folks like that? You know, you invite them to come to church and they just constantly make excuses. Oh, you know, I would come, but you know, I work on the weekend. Or, you know, I would come, but you know, I got this event coming up and, you know, you know I would come, but this, and I would come because of that. 
I trust that you are not a part of those who make excuses. Because guess what? On judgment day, according to Romans chapter number two, the Bible says there will be no excuse that will fly on judgment day as to why you didn't serve the Lord. When the Lord gave you an invitation through one of his saints, through one of his believers to come to the house, but you made excuses. So on that day, and everybody will stand before God to give an account for the deeds that's done in your body, on that day, you will have no excuse. Your excuse won't fly on judgment day. You, you know, your, your, what had happened was, won't fly with God on that day. So let's end this with Matthew chapter number eight, the gospel according to Matthew chapter number eight. I'm gonna go to verse number 18, Matthews 8, 18, King James. Now, when Jesus saw the great multitude about to get here again, he saw the multitude. Remember last time he saw the multitude, he had compassion on them because they were helpless and they were confused. They were perplexed. They were like sheep with no shepherd. Everybody needs to be sitting under a shepherd, as I said before. Now, when Jesus saw the great multitude about him again, he commanded, I mean, he gave commandment to depart onto the other side. There's just too many people here. We just need to go to the other side, make some room. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee wheresoever thou goest. Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man have no way, nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said unto him, so one guy said, listen, I would follow you. We read the first guy, you know, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus made mention that, okay, foxes have hold. All right. So I think what he was referring to, listen, this journey that you're going to have following me is going to be a faith journey. Because a, a fox, a fox have hold. A fox have somewhere they can go for shelter, you know, and birds have their own nests. All right. The son of man have nowhere to lay his head. So in other words, the son of man, the life that I live is a life I live by faith. All right. And so if you're going to follow me, this is the kind of life that you're going to have to live. Everything going to be by faith. Because remember, when you read Luke chapter number 17, when he sent his disciple out to do ministry and to preach the gospel, he tell them to take no strip, take no clothes, don't take no, don't take no purse, because God is going to provide for you as you go. So he's saying, listen, in the natural, fox got holes, birds got nests, but the life I'm living down here, representing God, is going to be a life of faith. And some things may not seem certain or concrete to the natural eyes, but in the spiritual realm, it is. Because faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is our evidence that the things that exist in the unseen is real. We'll break that down a little bit more, all right? And certain scribes came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whatsoever thou goest. Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man have nowhere, nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples, okay, you know, people who are following Christ, said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. So again, making excuses. Lord, I come follow you, but my, my dad just died. So let me go bury my dad first. You would think Jesus would say, okay, I understand. You know, go ahead and bury pop. And after you bury your dad, then come. Nope, that wasn't Jesus' response. And when you listen to Jesus' response, man, it almost sounds like, Jesus was not sensitive, but let me tell you something. He was about spiritual things. He was about the spiritual well-being of mankind because this flesh is not going to last forever. It's the spirit man that's going to last. So he was trying to cause mankind to make a spiritual connection with God. So when you listen to his response, it's almost sound insensitive. So this person said, listen, I will follow you, but suffer me, or that word suffer means allow me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Man, that sounds insensitive, doesn't it? Follow me and let the dead folks bury the dead folks. That's what that sounds like to me. All right, matter of fact, let's, let's look at that uh, in a different translation. Verse number 21, another disciple said to him, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. Collect my inheritance. <laughs> wow, that was his purpose. I like that. He said, listen, let me go bury my father because I want to make sure I get what's coming to me. There's a will here. Got to be a reason. All right. This, this, this translation said to collect my inheritance. But Jesus said unto him, follow me 
believing in me as master and teacher and allow the spiritual dead to bury their own dead. So that's what Jesus was saying. Let those folks who are spiritually dead, let them bury their own dead. He wasn't being insensitive. He was stating a fact. They were spiritually dead. So when you don't know Jesus and you're not in a relationship with God, you are spiritually dead. And so when you're burying somebody who have died naturally, it's the spiritual dead burying somebody that's dead. That's all Jesus said. He wasn't insensitive at all. He was stating a fact. But what I want to show you, look at the excuses. People admit, I would follow you, you know, but let me do this first. You know, I will come to church, but, you know, let me get a suit first. Let me get an outfit first. Listen, God ain't concerned about your suit. He certainly ain't concerned about your outfit. He's concerned about your heart because men look at on the outward appearance, the Bible says. So if you're waiting to get an outfit before you come to church, that means your eyes is on what people think or what people are going to see when you come in. You're not there to see people. You're not there to meet people. You're there to meet with God and to develop a relationship with him. So you come as you are with what you have. And he'll receive you because men look at on the outward appearance, but God looks down at the heart. Okay, so again, I just wanted to show you that scripture there. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with a saying. I used to do this a lot when we first started out. I'll give you some food for thought, and I end with a saying. And so this is my saying for tonight as I close this message. Don't try to get ready. Live ready so God can use you every day. That's my saying for tonight. I'll say it one more time. Don't try to get ready. Live ready so God can use you every day. Did you get something out of this word tonight? Hallelujah to God. Hey, Amen. If he told you to do something right now, would you be able to say, behold, Lord, here am I. I'm ready. Or do God have to knock you off your high horse before you say, oh, who are you, Lord? Because he'll do it if he has to. But it's much more easier if you could just stay on your horse or you can live your life and he'd have to knock you to the ground, smack you upside your head and knock your eyeballs out before you say, yes, Lord. It works better when you can sit down on your beast or you can sit down and you can walk and you keep your eyes and you're not blind for three days. Much easier. What you think? Glory to God. Amen. Listen, I hope you got something out of the word tonight. I'm ready. Lord, and that's what you should be able to say. Raise your hand tonight. Say, Lord, if you need me to do something today, right now, I'm ready. No reservation. I'm ready. Because you know what? There's some folks who need to be ministered to right now. Listen, there's some folks you know that need encouraging right now. Why are you going to wait till tomorrow to call? Let me see. What time is it? It's not even 8 o'clock yet. Come on. Most folks don't go to bed till like 10, 11 o'clock and they got to go to work the next day. There's somebody you know right now that need encouragement. There's somebody right now that you know that's going through some things and they can use a word of encouragement. Come on. If he asks you to do something, and he's asking us all the time, he's always ministering to our heart and putting good gestures in our heart and things to do because every time you have an opportunity, the Bible says do good to all men, especially those who have the household of faith. So when God put that in your heart to do, are you ready? So don't try to get ready, live ready. And God will be able to use you every day, all day, at any time.